Welcome to World of Short Selling, a podcast focused exclusively on what is happening in the short selling space. Who is short what and why? Tune in every Friday to find out. I would like to warmly welcome everyone to an interview with Gabe Bernard, one of the three prolific analysts that are Viceroy Research. In this interview, you will learn how Gabe sources his short ideas, what he learned so far working as a part of Viceroy, what he thinks about pre-team and cap tech, stocks that are actually up since Viceroy's report, how does it feel to have regulators investigating you, and what is his favorite nickname given to him by people who disagree with him. Before we start, I would just like to remind you that all you hear on the podcast are opinions. I am not registered investment advisor. Please do your own due diligence. Short selling can hold risks that are different to going long. You should assume that we're short the names we discuss. So with great pleasure, I would like to welcome Gabe uh, Bernard to the podcast. Thank you for accepting the invite. Thanks for having me. Um, Awesome. So uh, let's go straight to the uh, question. What brought you to Viceroy and how did you start with short selling actually? Uh, I think it came sort of by accident. Um, I was working at a a liquidator when I was studying uh, right after I finished high school and we I guess through that process of um, being the one to essentially review these businesses, uh, write up the investigations of like what what happened, what went wrong, um, trying to run through recapitalizations um, and also the instances of where fraud had occurred. Uh, I think it became, I became a bit disheartened with um, I guess some of the like regulatory process and um, the overall lack of empathy I-, I felt from ASIC. So it almost became, a, it wasn't really a holier than thou thing, but it almost became a sort of venting platform where I would just start researching companies that I felt were exaggerating and how this could go badly because I felt that if you just ripped the bandaid off at that point in time, it would prevent it from getting any worse. I think eventually people started paying attention. And then through that process, you know, I started working with Iden. I started doing some channel checks for some hedge funds overseas. Um, and eventually we met Fraser and yeah, I mean, it, it we really just, I just fell into it. It was really something that I super, I guess, sought out. You know, I didn't grow up and think, oh, I want to be a short seller. Yeah, I, th- I think a few older. people have that, yeah. Really. Yeah, as Mark says, you have to have some sort of brain damage to do it, um, which kind of sure. terrifies me because, like, most people that do this are totally insane. And I feel like <laughs> if I have to get to that point, you know. Sure, sure. But the start was that you actually were exposed to kind of um yeah. these situations and then you kind of start looking into more of them and, yeah, sure. And you do right. your own... Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I think we write a lot of things that a lot of people are a bit hesitant to say, as well. I mean, in most cases, the we ran out a report and the "I told you so"s that come flying out. Like everyone knew this was happening, or at least everyone pretended to know. But why did anyone actually, you know, say something? Is is so like, sure. Phenomenal. Yeah. Sure. It's actually going out there and publicly right. doing something. I uh, got it. And. Um, Maybe regarding your research process, like what have you previously focused on uh, uh, less uh, than you do today? So essentially, you know, throughout, you know, your start as just a interested person in the, the situations, what are you focusing on much more uh, right now? Uh, I think at the start, it was at the start, we weren't really doing short reports. We were kind of validating other people's short reports as well. Um, and that would be like surveying um, I basically like stood outside stores and I'd like click how people like went in and out account for traffic. And that data is you know, useful to someone to validate the thesis of like, oh, this Christmas season is going to be shit. And I can go there and say, actually, the stores look pretty full on a Wednesday midday. Yeah. Yeah. I heard now, now, nowadays, some people use satellites and stuff. So you did it the old way. You just really counted it. Yeah. I did it old fashioned way. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think that was like the, the focus originally was retail and i think that the um i think that over time the the thesis has become more technical generally and i think that that's 
um, really something that we have been focusing on improving because basically we try to write this in the most like Lehman terms possible. You know, if, for example, Iden's wife can't understand it and she's not in any scope, like in the finance realm at all, then we assume that no one else will understand it either. So explaining something very technical, like a Thenex, for example, uh, is difficult, I suppose. Um, and I think we're moving into that more, like whether it's technical because the app, like the their solution or their product is technical or the service they provide or the accounting is technical. Mm -hmm. We, I think over time we've been sort of hammering down on like these harder kind of. Sure, so essentially harder to research, but then you also have to write about it in a way where people understand the thesis quite yeah, clearly. Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not as plain cut as like the stores don't exist. Yeah, sure. You know, like a folly folly kind of thing. Sure, sure. I, I get that. I get that. That's uh, and also I think I, I guess that's harder to find. Or have you found, you know, with regards? To, I, I don't know how many years you're already doing this, but essentially throughout, you know, your experience, how, did you did you notice a change in terms of how how the fraud is obvious or not? Or was that you know was it kind of similar? Is just like different iteration of the same thing? Or is it something that you know you you kind of look at and say, hey, it's you know not as obvious as it used to be. Um, I've only been, I'm, I'm super young, like I'm 25. So maybe ask me in 10 years and I'd have a better answer. <laughs> with your experience that you have, yeah. it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't matter with, with it. I, I think it's just been basically the same. Okay. Like people just, like, it's, it's, uh, I think that there's like some, there's definitely some cultural aspect that makes it different. Like in Australia, when we found fraud here, it's been pretty blatant, but for example, oh, and in China for, I, I, I mean. You, have you watched the China Hustle? Yeah, yeah. I, I've talked to some of the people involved in that documentary, like um, John Parnes, the the guy behind Alfred Little, the the blog, and, and so on and so forth. So, sure. Yeah, these these been like great. Yeah. And, and some of these are just so blatant, but then then you have stuff like Mimetics, which is very um, well. It's sort of subterfuge. Uh, I mean, it was this guy creates like some sort of special ops spying operation to like go and harass whistleblowers that are trying to tell people. I, I think, I think it's pretty much the same either way. Yeah, sure. I guess the, the basis probably is, uh, very much, uh, very much the same. Yeah. Um, and have you, um, so you said you maybe start with a bit of retail, you know, channel checking and so on and so forth. Is there some sort of area that you prefer the most, or, you know, is there an area that you focused on quite a lot? You know, I mean, of course, when I look at Viceroy, you kind of do all, all, all around, you know, you don't really care about the industry or geography, but is there some area that you yourself or Viceroy um, um, kind of like more or looked at uh, more in the past? Well, Aiden, Aiden who's uh, one of the other guys I work with, uh, is an engineer by, by background. Uh, he likes to do extremely technical, like anything with math. So... I don't know, the man just like, I think even when we started on my medics, you just pick up all the clinical trials and start reading them. And, you know, no one else could really understand what you're sure. saying, but it worked out. Uh, I think from my end, it's just more, uh, I was finance background. Um, I did a lot of financial investigations into sort of hiding cash. So probably more on the, what, where's your money kind of thing. So I don't think it's super industry specific. I just think it's sort of, uh, I'm more interested in it looks too good to be true. And uh, and do you have any sort of um, process for sourcing the ideas or is it just that, you know, you kind of um, uh, look at what, what people write about or what's trending in the news, especially <laughs> since you said, you know, what's uh, too good to be true? Like, do you have any sort of um, process regarding that or? Um, yeah, I mean, we have we have like screens that we run uh, and says that we have in, like this big spreadsheet that we're always sort of coming to and from some reports that we have like just been sitting there for like months or even years that are totally complete, but we just don't know if this scenario essentially will play out or the timing might not be right. But I mean, since sort of inception to now, we get so many um, people sort of reaching out with us uh, to us with ideas that it also becomes like, we're not only screening, I don't know, like cap IQ, um, but, um, people would, even if it's some sort of like bland consumer complaint, we would kind of like, just take a quick look at it. 
it's actually super strange when we put out a report on Capitech, for example. Um, people started CCing us into their like, customer service emails, <laughs> thinking that like we we would do something when they were complaining about like poor service. I, I really didn't care. And I replied back. I was like, "You should email me." Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's an that's an interesting way to do that. Uh, to, uh, with the short seller attached. That's pretty uh, cool. That's yeah, pretty cool. I, I don't know. We we kind of just vet a lot of things, but we're we're extremely. Um, I mean, me and Aiden and Fraser all work on separate things totally separately until we have something that's sort of ready to go. And then we kind of bump heads, I guess, you know, we all do our own thing, if that makes sense. And vice versa, like the platform. Yeah. Yeah, I know, of course. And then if you feel that there is something yeah. really, really big, you kind of discuss it and make sure that um, the logic makes uh, makes sense. And regarding the screeners, you know, do, do you have any sort of you know, is it is it kind of loose screeners where you say, okay, you know, the profit is larger than the industry averages, or what kind of you know what kind of types do you have there? Um, well, the biggest ones for us, like financially speaking, are sort of cash or cash based. So other you know, is like how much of your earnings translates to cash kind of thing. And if it doesn't, then like something's strange. But I guess that d- depends from industry to industry. We also have some other metrics that we like to use like it's the it's almost like a reverse screen it's like if your auditor is not one of the big four and your market cap's over 500 mil <laughs> true or you know if your auditor is cherry beckett generally <laughs> we, your abix and your medics so just like sort of off the wall ones obviously if you're all of your former directors were involved in like frauds that's pretty big tell yeah um, not really screened for that, but the names just kind of pop back at you. Yeah, sure. I, do, you, do you actually like maintain in some ways or other um, like a database with people connected to fraud or is it just like kind of like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah or do you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's not very sophisticated. It's just like a list on Excel, but we sort of come across names that are even sort of, uh, I guess, uh, not even directly related to companies, but just like people that seem to be somehow attached to all of these frauds as a third party like a, a provider yeah like a auditor some or sort of whatever. provider mm-hmm. like pr agency um senator <laughs> <laughs> sure sure yeah. and regarding geography uh you know or sorry um regarding market cap that was my question uh do you kind of look at small caps large caps you don't care do you have a preference or you know how do you how do you think about that um, not really. I mean, it's pretty broad as long as it sort of trades for us to be able to short the stock. Okay. It's an acceptable level of risk that we can get out of it if we are wrong or if we're, or if we're right, you know, like if it goes down 50% and like no volume trades. It's like we can't really sell. So I don't know. It, it's more of a volume question than it is a... Yeah, of course. Yeah, true. Um, I, I guess I get you if it's, if it's liquid enough. Um, but there's also like reports that we'd write that never get published, but we'd still show up the stock. If it's something like, oh, we think that this very bureaucratic thing will happen. Um, it's really worth us putting a report saying that we speculate this bureaucratic thing will happen. We just sort of short it because I don't think that, I mean, trying to, <laughs> trying to wait for the government to do something is a bit mundane and a report expecting that it would happen is also naive which i've learned in the past (laughs) yeah i get that so is it is it that you you know release a report when you know there's really kind of a very clear catalyst that you're very comfortable with or what's kind of the line you know where you decide okay this is probably a good short but we're not gonna really publicize it or where do you draw draw the line i don't know i think it's a mixture of both the conviction has to be like ex- extremely high. Sure. Uh, but at the same time, we're sort of aware of how much reach we have. I and mean, us putting out a report on like, it just this is a hypothetical, uh, grossly exaggerated. But if I uh, put out hypothetically a report saying Google was a massive fraud, no one would care. Um, so I suppose e- even if I was very high conviction, it, it would just look like, okay, these guys with the tinfoil hat think Google's a fraud. Uh, and hindsight is not, you know, so that there, there has to be like, we have to trigger some sort of, um, 
we have to really, there has to be a catalyst, I suppose. I mean, if we think that this company is going to unwind by itself, then no, we won't bother publishing on it. Um, but if there's, for example, I don't know, like MyMedics, where this thing was just like awful uh, and no one was really talking about it. like this sort of underlying issue within the business, um, then it's probably worthwhile publishing something. Yeah, I guess it's um, it's uh, almost as uh, if you want to kind of change the perspective, right? Like people look at sure. the company, maybe they're looking into what you believe is the reason to short it. But with my medics or whatever have you, there might be some things that people just don't know or don't really talk about. I guess that would that be a right. fair? Okay, yeah, I think sure. that's fair. Yeah. Mm, and regarding um, timing of the reports, so how do you think about that? You know, obviously, uh, and it's not only reports, but shorting itself. Uh, like, how do you how do you think about, or what was your experience, or maybe, um, I, I guess the 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 general uh, question that I should probably put it, be asking is like, what is your bad experience with timing, and what have you learned from it? <laughs> oh my God, I almost always have bad experiences with timing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't think that there's one report that we put out that we said, yes, this is time to perfection. Yeah, sure. I, this is, this might be really, really naive, but usually when I'm super high conviction and I'm ready to put something out, I'm like, I don't think the timing even matters. You know, if this is, if, you know, we're going to put out a report and say like this, these guys say their Chinese factory exists and I just wait, we send a PI there and it doesn't. I think that's a big deal. Like, apparently people don't, but <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. But just as a hypothetical, yeah. uh, I don't know. We, we've had like multiple, multiple reports where um, everything sort of played out to the line and it was maybe like six months later through to three years later. Um, it's, you know, and, and I think that those are probably amongst our most successful yeah. trades. Like they're not, I think sometimes there's like a, um, like a short, uh, like a one day shot opportunity in there. And then it just sort of like bumps up again, but it just keeps going down. Like perceive and sat. I mean, down to the T, like we wrote exactly what we thought was going to happen with like this, their TV ups, um, all of these sort of acquisitions they were making in this tech space, uh, how their revenue is being treated and it was never going to convert to cash. And then, um, you know, instead of, uh, I said, I mean, we never really said it was, uh, a fraud. I don't think it was a fraud. I think it's just like some sort of terminal business model. And they've tried to fix it with another, they've tried to create turn it like a TV channel into a VC fund, which also doesn't help money if your TV channel is burning all this money. It just took ages for to people to realize. And I don't think that we, I mean, we never appeared in the news after the first week other than uh, the German regulators say that they were investigating us for market manipulation. Well, of course, everybody knows the German regulators. So. <laughs> Oh my God. It's just the craziest. We'll, we'll probably get to that as well. Um, maybe just one more question. Like, w would there be any red flags, uh, regarding timing that you're really looking for? Um, so what I mean by that is, you know, if you look at a stock, you think it's, um, a great short, you know, is there something that you look for and say, okay, I'm not going to short it now because that is not great timing. You know, is there something that, you know, you really look for and say, Hey, if this is happening, I'm not going to do it. I don't know. I think if, if you have conviction, you could sort of play both ways against events. I mean, I, I, that's what, if you're, if you're looking for like an event driven short, you're playing around like, oh, this is a pharmaceutical company. They're, you know, phase, whatever is going to on this day and I think it's going to be rubbish. If you have high enough conviction that the, you know, result is going to be rubbish, then you'd play that event. Um, I suppose that's the, the issue with that is if it doesn't go your way, then maybe it wasn't a great shot. Sure, sure. I mean, I guess the risk of like being just a, or having a binary short thesis right. where it's like, well, either you make a killing or the market will kill you. Yeah, sure. Right. And even sort of like end of the year, I mean, December is, usually pretty quiet. I mean, I've done this for two years, so I quote me on this, but I've usually found December pretty quiet. I'm not sure if it's because I've been partying too hard, but generally I just don't see any other short reports out there. Kind of quiet um, on that front. So I, I don't know. December's usually like a no-go for us, start of January. Same. Okay, yeah, I get that. I mean, the timing is always, you know, um, 
a tough question. Um, do you guys uh, use options or is it outright shorting only or what's been this experience with you? Um, I can't, I can't discuss that, unfortunately. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, okay, on to the next thing. What is the best uh, and what was the worst trade and what you learned from these two? I'm, I'm purely going to speak from uh, the perspective of what we wrote uh, and how the market reacted to these, not in terms of returns, because I can't discuss those. Um, I think the best reports we've written generally were the ones where we didn't feel like there was a need for any follow-up. And perhaps that's naive at the moment. Um, I mean, my medics, we did several follow-up reports and it was just because more and more data kept sort of flooding out um, to us. But usually like with Syrah resources, um, with uh, Quintus, which we did after uh, uh, Glaucus came out with the initial um, mm -hmm. Perceive and Sat. I mean, we did a report on Neuroderm, which was essentially to try to prevent a buyout, but the buyout had already been announced. So it was almost like a zero loss game for us. The, like the stock wasn't going to go up. I think that they were the uh, best reports purely because of sort of, I mean, some of them weren't, a lot of them weren't immediate, but um, they have for some reason or another just been the ones that have warranted absolutely no response from us. And the stock has just slid and played out exactly as we, as we planned. Um, and I think personally, the most stress inducing and um, I guess like the, the more difficult reports have been the ones where we have to essentially fight against uh, a management team that keeps reiterating this sort of nonsense, um, I don't know, ploy, let's say, that we've completely debunked. And it's sort of tricky to get headwind into uh, a platform, a media platform that they're so much more dominant than us in. Uh, and that just takes work. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not lazy. I just had better things to do. Um, so, so this is like, I mean, my, my medics was a sort of classic, classic example. I mean, a lot of our subsequent reports weren't even, um, necessarily new data. It was sort of throwing Pete Petit under the bus with these, his, uh, short seller response that were, you know, calling us criminals and all that nonsense. I think that they're, they're the more more difficult ones. And it takes a bit of self-restraint as well to not <laughs> go over the, <laughs> overboard with these responses, sure. I suppose. Um, and the ones that we get sued for, obviously, Rheumatics included, uh, despite the fact that we're nowhere, you know, I, we have better things to do. Yeah, yeah. You're going out that. against um, like a very um, litigious uh, management team. It's generally a bad idea. Sure, sure. And I mean, regarding, um, you know, was there was there something that really stood out when you said like, oh, we should have done this differently, not necessarily publishing of the report, but really the research process, for example, you know, maybe we should have double checked something more or whatever, like, you know, was there some was there some situation like that? And it doesn't even have to be, you know, in a publicized report, but just generally, uh, you know, some, some sort of um, uh, list of things where, we, you know, you need to work more after uh, it happened yeah i don't know like we get um we get like you know some close friends of ours that you know aren't in the finance spec like the space to kind of have a read of our reports and see what they think and if it makes sense and then we have to sort of explain the thesis back to us because if we like our our process has always been like if they don't understand what we're talking about what's well, going to understand what we're talking about uh there's always been some uh i guess from the more financially astute uh, readers that maybe this is too layman or you've gone over explaining X, Y, Z, or it doesn't need like a company background to this detail. Uh, and try to sort of counteract that with like a very, very short summary with sort of headline items. But in terms of, in retrospect, the only things that I can think of is like, really is like, I put, should probably shouldn't have put memes and like, my first report or second um <laughs> because some people just got to the first page and saw this like meme like okay this must be a joke uh, yeah okay uh, i saw that on the website on my <laughs> website yeah which <laughs> is yeah fair enough fine for yeah, me yeah i'll just I keep it to my understand. personal twitter now like not on my report 
<laughs> sure, sure. I get that. With that, with that in mind, I actually uh, checked out your Twitter and like um, I saw that you posted Instagram profile called LinkedIn Flex, oh, uh, yeah. which was like which was really great. But actually, it's deleted now. So yeah, no, they had to they had to open up another one. I'll send you the new. Link. Oh really? Put it up on the okay, please do that <laughs> because the the initial post that you post on Twitter was really amazing. There was this wife, I believe, or was yeah. it a partner of yeah. partner of the chief CEO of UBS Management in Australia? Right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, like or or th or congratulating the the husband on like years of taking cocaine and stuff like that, which was just really great. Yeah. So like that's a great you know that's a great source of short ideas. I mean okay, exactly. UBS probably I mean it's it's short that, but it's kind of weird, right? But the <laughs> it's so much in this sort of social sphere that I think people miss out on, and I, like my Instagram is just this garbage can of financial memes that i follow wow i need i need to update my instagram feed yeah okay. exactly okay, and that's then, cool and then sure. like, this is really weird but there's this uh, reddit page called um wall street bets not sure if you've heard uh -huh. of it no 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 i haven't done and it's like it's like um you know stock twits yes yes it's like with stock twits but with even more bag holders these are the guys <laughs> that put out like the robin hood hack where you could like yeah sure your margin okay. to infinity and some of the stuff that comes up there is just surreal like legitimate leads have come through reading the okay, stupid yeah. shit these guys post on wall street bets yeah sure sure i i think i heard actually now that you talk about it i think i heard some stories about it like people just betting like on the earnings of apple all their money or something and and yeah. shooting a video then, with it as well or something like yeah that. On, on like they flex like two thousand dollars into like five hundred thousand dollars or something and then they put a lot <laughs> they're losing like a hundred fifty thousand dollars which i don't even have it's just insanity yeah like, sure sure I, yeah okay. i don't know <laughs> i get that do you actually have any sort of because i know marco hodas uh, calls it the fake wig test uh do you have any sort of equivalent of spawning fraud in in terms of like you know things that might people might not look at but you know kind of doubt. <laughs> uh Jeez, I'm not sure. I think the wig indicator is probably a pretty good one. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I recently, I don't know which stock it was and who, who it was, but I saw that there was some short seller tweeted a picture of the person of the management, I think, who had a like this kind of death, like ring, yeah. and it had like a death skull on that or something like. That. Yeah, I was just about to say actually yeah. that there's there's always some there's always some strange ones. I mean. I went on as Halloween, I dressed as a pimp, but I just thought, like, I thought it'd be funny if I put it on my Twitter and say that I went as a stock promoter. So maybe, you know, like, you know, gold chains that are a bit too big. Uh, you have more than like two buttons undone on your shirt, like those kind of fur coats or like loud shirts. Maybe that's a good indicator. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Robin Rayner, right? Uh, the Evix guy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I hazard to say that if you rocked up to a CNBC interview, um, and people were like looking at your pecs on a see-through shirt, um, and you had these like oversized aviator yeah. gold rim sunglasses. That I their office video is absolutely hilarious as well because it's like they have this office. I don't know where it is exactly in India. I uh, skipped my mind, but it's almost like a gangster rap video clip. Like if you played "Roll Out" by Ludacris over the top of this video, it would fit right in. As they've got like vintage cars, like on the ceiling and like there's like these silhouettes of strippers on the cafeteria walls it's really fucking weird yeah okay i will check it out later but uh, i haven't i haven't seen that uh but yeah so there's a lot of lot of these kind of things that can also alert you or yeah yeah sure sure that's um um that's really that's really fun yeah now, i think so uh, since we discussed kind of the best and the worst trades and what kind of you learned from the process maybe we can now move on to specific stocks and i guess i would start with atnx uh, atnx uh which is uh a stock that I, mm -hmm. I kind of looked at um, a couple of times already, uh, mainly because of, of you guys uh, and, and your work. Um, and so this is sort of a biotech with uh, a lot of um, interesting corporate governance um, um, uh, topics uh, to be to be discussed. But if you could just kind of, you know, bring us up to speed regarding the context for those who have not followed the story, like what kind of is the basic thesis there? Yeah. Um... So these guys at the next do, uh, it's a drug development company. Um, 
Their flagship drug is called um, Araxel, and it's essentially a chemothera chemotherapy substitute for IV, which is like um, it's like a almost like a pill, it's orally digested, and it's run by a collective um, management team, which stuck out to us like a sore thumb because these guys have been involved in some of the most notorious frauds like in the last sort of 10 years, I guess just in terms of, uh, of context, um, we have, you know, uh, this, um, former directors involved in Sino forest. We have members of management involved in Chelsea therapeutics. Uh, we have GSK in there. We have, I mean, I, I could, go, I could go on. Yeah, sure. It's, it's a long list, but yeah, a lot of red flags. Yeah. It's, this is, this is a very, very long list. Um, and it's not just situated within sort of one um, one person. It's not just one bad actor. This was very broad. I mean, this was like a large portion of management and the director board, uh, which sort of got us looking more into uh, the drug, um, the pipeline, and some of the finances. So I think initial report um, that we wrote, we did a lot of digging on some related party dealings. So we found Athabex had this uh, tendency, I suppose, um, to buy um, licenses. I think it's probably the best way to put licenses um, from a related party company called um, Avalon. And Avalon is essentially owned by the uh, CEO and two other directors, or one of them is a former director now. Um, and essentially, if we looked into the history of where Avalon received the li these licenses, it was like Avalon purchased license for X product from Hong Kong Polytechnic uh, for $150,000 and sold to Athenex for $5 million within a very short time frame where we don't believe that there was any sort of work conducted uh, or improvement conducted or any new results, um, which essentially just means that you're siphoning money from your shareholders into your own pockets. And it's actually, I mean, this is perhaps something we didn't touch on enough. If you're buying licenses from a university, you're directly impacting their funding too. Because if it really was worth $5 million, then they should have gotten the money, not sure. the directors. So you're fucking someone. Sure. Yeah, that this is this was like one of the biggest things that, yeah, of course, popped out in the research. Yeah. Right. Um, we kind of, we did go into in, in detail, sort of uh, in the first report, like the background of a lot of the directors. And we had um, tendencies of these guys to do the exact same thing at other businesses. So, for example, uh, Zhang, who was a uh, board member at Athenex, who resigned just earlier this year and remains a controlling shareholder of Avalon, which is this related mm -hmm. party that they keep buying drugs from or licenses from, um, was involved in Sino Forest. Um, how, how actually, I had a kind of a follow up on that. How he, was he not? you know, dealing with this, um, a bit more in terms of the legal stuff, like what, how I, I'm, 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 I'm not super sure, like if Center was sued by, I believe there was some sort of lawsuit ongoing. Right. And so how, like he was not implicated in that or it was, it was almost like, uh, so we have this company called Mandra, right. And Mandra still exists within some sort of form or another, or under some sort of mm -hmm. different name. Um, which is run by Zhang. And basically, Mandra was uh, launched to acquire 270,000 hectares mm -hmm. of timberland uh, with a $195 million like US loan. Sino Forest was a 15% shareholder, uh, Morgan Stanley 10%, Zhang remaining 75 So despite uh, despite Zhang sort of leaving as a um, directly involved, but still remained a, you know, the, the chairman of the company, um, prior to the, the debt raise, um, they drew out this massive loan. Um, they were meant to acquire 270,000 hectares of timberland uh, within you know, a short amount of time. It only acquired about 17,000 hectares. It completely missed all of its sort of payment dates. They failed to obtain permission to increase timber production. And essentially, it was sort of like a sign of forest had to buy all of these assets and assume an average, like $200 million of debt because Mandra had severely, severely missed like all of its targets of acquiring anything and 
you know, I don't know, just sort of disappeared with like 190 million US dollars. So I suppose it was, it, it was directly responsible for Sino having to assume this debt, but he was not in yeah, Sino itself. Okay. Yeah, I get it. So the responsibility circle was slightly, yeah, it was, was not, he was not there because you could probably say that, oh, right. it's business conditions or whatever. Right. And you, you'd forgive him if he didn't go out and do the same sort of thing with like SunTech um, almost immediately after. And SunTech was basically like, um, these guys announced that uh, they had a bunch of um, German bonds uh, from a 500 million euro loan and the bonds never existed and the 500 million euro loan was gone. I mean, like, that's, it's just one of those things. It's so easy to check if they, these bonds exist. And even though he, these guys are all saying like, oh, no, we delegated it out to like these people to look over this investment account, whatever. And it's their fault. And it was all the mafia. Like, fuck off. You know, you're a director of the business. You have a, a, a responsibility to know if you've hired the mafia to run your finances. Uh, and then we have guys that were, you know, who's involved in companies who are indicted for the largest, um, the tree that makes the, uh, hold on, this is going to annoy me now. I need to find it. Tax all smuggling. Right. So we had, you know, businesses that these guys are still directly in contact with, um, still, well, allegedly still buying um, tax all from the largest tax all smuggling operation in China where dozens of people went to prison. You have, I don't know, it's Chelsea Therapeutics, you know, the same kind of thing where like the company was down to, I don't know, overstate the, the how good their drug was. Um, so I, I think that was a, that all sort of got us interested in the, the drug itself. And then we basically had expert contractor come in to look at Araxol alongside Aiden, who does a pretty good job of it by himself. He's not really a scientist. So on the original report, we kind of put out that like there is some concerns relating to safety and the management assertion that that there was a primary endpoint met within this drug was like not really accurate. The drug has two primary endpoints and the primary endpoint is not just the uh, efficacy. There is also a benefit to risk profile, which is basically like safety. And this is something that they've really um, shied away from in any sort of updates. Both of our consultants that we've engaged and one actually wrote a full report. We've had to anonymize their name, but the report's available in full in. Um... Yeah, I'll put up the link for your website anyway. So yeah, for sure, where you can find actually the whole sure. report. Yeah. Basically, uh, I think the biggest concerns was that there wasn't an acceptable benefits risk profile. The there were oddities such as, although that yes, the the IV IV treatment can be used as a, a sort of standard of care uh, measurement, we still think that um, you know perhaps it's not the case. There have been yeah, I mean, I I get that. Uh, I get the essentially saying, well, you know, that that's in the end the the efficiency can be uh, questioned uh, quite quite clearly. We don't have to go necessarily into like the very, very specific details. Uh, yeah. Uh, because I mean, from, yeah, from my, because okay. in the end, from my point of view, like you have the corporate government's thesis, right. like, which is very, you know, th there are some huge red flags there and, you know, you, you, you deliver the report right. and you can kind of check that. All right. So I'll, t I'll touch at this at a high level then. So basically at, uh, at a high level, despite there being a control group, that's, um, you know, IV, which is a current standard of care, uh, versus Araxel, which is this new method. There is different clinical studies done with IV paclitaxel that have yielded different results. So one of the oddities that was found was, for example, oh, this um, dosing regimen was one that provided some of the less or one of the more mediocre um, responses, overall survivability. So for example, yes, they could much easily, like much more easily meet efficacy using this dosing regimen over another dosing regimen. Yeah, sure. That no, I, yeah. So, uh, a lower dose more frequently or a higher dose less frequently. The PGP inhibitor, which is essentially the delivery method, like the oral delivery method, is not approved by the FDA as a, a mechanism, which was picked up that this could be the cause of some side effects that are inconsistent with the current standard of care. So, for example, uh, gastrointestinal 
gastrointestinal complications were not a huge factor with IV paclitaxel, but now are showing up, we think, with some, you know, material degree uh, with Araxel. And this is significant because this means that although the drug itself or, you know, paclitaxel is sort of approved, but this new delivery method might need its own uh, FDA trial to see if it is safe to use. So that's consistent with what we'd written at the start. And I think like one of the biggest sort of subliminal issues to this is that Athonics have conducted this trial entirely outside of the US. Yeah, that's that's something that stood out for me as a, you know, as a clear red flag or at least something that because obviously I don't necessarily understand yeah, all of the biotech correct. um research behind it, but I kind of said, okay, well, the fundamentals, you know, that that that's kind of strange. Yeah, I mean, there could be reasons to that. It could be cost, but this company has so much money that I don't understand why they would take such a huge risk in doing this. And you could very easily do the same test in the US and there is a direct correlation with the rarity of the FDA approving drugs and there being no USA clinical patient data. That is just straight up. Uh, so uh, with all these issues, we just don't, we don't really see yeah. it happening. One last thing regarding the drug, um, you know, so obviously uh, what happened to the stock was that you released the report, it went down a bit, but then they kind of released a couple of PRs. They did re respond, but they just said, well, we don't agree. Nothing really, nothing really much. They didn't really target any of your uh, statements um, that. Yeah, they said that they, uh, they stand behind the integrity of his management team who have committed fraud numerous times in the past. Yeah, so yeah, a, yeah. That's a that's a cool way to put it. So, uh, so there yeah. you go. Like, I think I think that the response was not really aimed at any of your arguments. They had a conference call where there was like literally no reference to the yeah. report at all, which I felt was was certainly something that I mean that that's their choice. I guess like whatever. Like, you don't want to respond, that's fine. But obviously, you know, um, if you are going to at least acknowledge it, then maybe you should have. Uh, aimed uh, at some of the statements, but of course that's that's for the management to decide. Right. Th there was that that I'm thinking talking about that press release. Um, and that was one of the more recent, um, sort of November twentieth uh, or nineteenth. Uh, these guys put out a press release, basically changing the name of their presentation at the um, San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium to a name that sort of implies that it is as superior uh, I think successful or superior yes. performance to the to the existing uh, to the existing yeah methods right uh, on confirmed response on survival with less neuropathy um, which people interpreted as this is going to be great because there's better overall survival um, firstly we thought this was like the pump of the century uh, personal opinion but whatever maybe I'm just bitter the abstracts that were submitted to this were done in July and there was no changes made to any of the data that these guys are presenting at the symposium. So the fact that there was a name change is just so bizarre uh, and it's still vague uh, in my mind, um, but that was essentially the reason for like this big, like the big spike, I suppose. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I don't see how that changes anything from what I've written in the past has certainly not changed their opinion, our opinion or that of sure, our consultants. Sure, sure, sure. I get that. No. Uh, do, you, do you think it could be actually about the first uh, primary endpoint rather than the the risk, you know, or safety, let's say? Or, you know, do you think it's just... I don't think so. I mean, there's there's two primary endpoints. I meant the, uh, the, the, the first one, let's say, being the efficacy and then the second one being the safety, you know, changing the presentation name because actually they kind of... Um, are focused mostly on the first uh, primary endpoint rather than the safety. Sure, I, I mean they they probably want to sure. if that was a better one. Um, who knows? I, at this point, like we're yeah, speculating, sure. right? Um, we we put out the report from the data we have to date. Uh, I you know from our consultants, like we haven't adulterated yeah. anything in that report. And I think that gives the best technical explanation of what exactly is happening. And re regarding, you know, the, the short position, like, you know, can, what, how do you think about the risk that actually the stock and hold, 
you know, um, up until the FDA really delivers the final blow in terms of rejecting the, the drug or, you know, th there is there is quite some time before maybe that happens because, of course, you know... You know the, sure, and, and there's never certainty either, you know, like... They yeah, sure. So, uh, so are you thinking about this somehow or...? Yeah, I mean, we're always kind of tracking these things. We have to manage our risk, obviously. Uh, but in terms of conviction, um, we are still, you know... Yeah, sure, there, sure. So. I mean, I guess, yeah, I, I guess when you see uh, such a corporate government, then, you know, you, you that, that, yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and, and the factory itself, I mean, that's been, that's been also another thing, yeah. Well, maybe talk about that as well. I mean, this is one of those funny ones that this is the report we wrote originally thinking we had nailed it by the first report, like every day, um, we would find something just, or someone would send us something that would just totally blow our minds. Like, how could it be worse? And I think the the cherry on top was was yeah exactly this, this sort of new um, Chinese factory in Athens announced that it was completed uh, September twenty third and then if you go to like Chinese state media there's all these pictures of actually most I think most of them are stock pictures of these guys touring the facility and this lovely reception and there's a picture of like there's actually one signage of Athens um, in in like it's just a hole in the wall with no ramp going up to the door so it's kind of like elevated but it's like a really big step up and i was like okay that doesn't look completed so then we sent someone there and we sent them to the uh, uh chongqing international bio city right which is essentially where they said this is their facility was going to be and our pi got there asked if athletic where athletics offices were and they're like they don't there's no athletics in this building and this is a really fancy building that they put up on their website in all fairness, it really does look like that. There is a lake next to it. There are some really nice trees. Athenex sure. is not in there. Uh, the Athenex site was somewhere about 40 kilometers, 25 miles away. So that was not the part of the BioCity at all, because I, as I understood it, the BioCity is some sort of development zone or... It is a, it's a massive development zone. Um, I mean, this, this whole development zone is, it is bigger than most US cities. Like this is probably like, I don't know. It was from memory. I think it was about 40 to 60 kilometers by 40 kilometers. Oh, okay. So they were part, they are, they are actually part of the bio city, but just not, let's say in the, no. So bio city was this, this specific site. Okay. Okay. Um, so this new site that they're in is 40 miles away from bio city. Mm -hmm. The development zone is not just um for pharma this is for everything okay okay got it i got it. it's very broad it's like we need to bring more business to this area let's build a huge development zone um so we went to this completed site and we found this athenex um sort of hole in the wall entry over the top of this um uh one of those construction fences yes um in a site that was had no roads to get into. There was still a crane on top of Athenex's building. And then we found another photo of the, you know, the PR day of the Athenex cutting the ribbon ceremony with dated October, which was, a, a you know, quite a little while after they said that they'd finished it with the building behind it still completely surrounded by scaffolding. Sure, sure. And like, no, like no walls on the bottom in some parts, like no windows, nothing. So this whole thing has just been like a complete ruse yeah because there's no completed site there is absolutely no way that can be doing the validation batch in a site that has a crane over the top of it and the only part of the um after its office that seems to be completed is the lobby where those pictures were. <laughs> well that's the most important part anyways right so <laughs> so that you right, make some nice PR, I suppose. <laughs> sure if this if these are the guys that are telling you like this is drugs going to be the next hot shit I would seriously think twice. Like, I'm a rational person, right? If they say, oh, yeah, we're going to do this validation batch, going to make tens of millions of dollars next year, you know, fucking manufacturing drugs in China in this brand new factory, which you completed, sent me a picture of it, and it was, like, not even the factory. That's a big red flag. Yeah. Not just for the factory, generally. So the materiality of this finding, like, what, what you found in China, so that relates to the drug in the sense that the factory should have produced... Uh, a validation batch, right, for of the pro of the drug, or uh... well, not only that. I think that the the reason that the value holds up in this business is that even if a Raxol does fail, that these guys have this sort of tangible API operation mm -hmm. that's going to come on. And obviously, 
this thing's not going to come online in the time frame that they want it to, because there's there's no way you can even put like a vat in this like in this place because there's no roads for you to get a truck in there. Sure, sure. Yeah. You know, like you you have all these pictures of some scientists with some really fancy new equipment on the website. It's not their office. Which is yeah, which is yeah, which certainly uh, raises uh, raises a lot of questions to say the least. Yeah, so let's see what happens on the 13th of, uh, of December. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and there was the other Chinese factory from before that, which has been shut down by the government. Oh yeah, yeah, you, you can mention that as well. Yeah, apparently voluntarily. So this is this this is the new factory we were just talking about, and the old factory, same city, and they put out a picture on their website, and it was completely rendered to the point that they even stuck their name on the front of the building and added like trees and shit, like an offense. And it's it's the easiest thing to spot because it is the worst rendering I've ever seen <laughs> sure. in my life. And they made the photo just real small, thinking that no one would notice. And we just blew it up to like 2X, and it's immediate. Like there's no shadows or anything. They put up a little American flag <laughs> and on the front, just to like make it seem as though like, oh yeah, this is definitely the Africa. These guys are American. Yeah, I, I always, I always, Crazy. Uh, yeah, I'm always fascinated by that. I always imagine like how, you know, they're thinking about it. Like, hey, like, well, we have the trees, but what about the American flag? Do you have the flag? Oh, God damn it. Okay, I'll add the flag, you know, and then they put it up. Like, and yeah, that's yeah. like you yeah. know, that, that must have been like, if, if someone were to be there and record it, that would be <laughs> the most hilarious thing, I think. That would be yeah, crazy. you'd love to be a fly on the wall. Over yeah, there. yeah, for sure. No, I get, I get that. Um, one last question regarding uh, uh, ATNX, so that we don't spend all of the time on it. Um, how did you actually learn about it? Like, what, what, what brought you uh, to 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 ATNX? This is one that it was like a bit of a tip off. We got uh, some data on the the drug, which we went to a consultant to validate, and then we got some data on the directors. But like, the more we looked into it, like this thing blew up so spectacularly. Mm -hmm. Like this has been a, like, we're still receiving more data on the shit that happens in this business. So it's just become, it's like, it's progressed, I believe to like this point where, I mean, it's the reason we could put out a report every day for like two weeks. It was as soon as we'd finished one, like sure enough, like half an hour later, I was thinking, yes, I'm gonna go to sleep. No, just get another email be like, oh, your report did you guys ever look at like this thing or this person um so but but definitely the the background of the directors was the biggest reason we kept, we started sure sure engaging. i get that yeah it kind of snowballed from um right. from there yeah um, cool. So now um, I would actually talk, I would like to talk about some other other stocks that you guys uh, wrote research uh, on and we mentioned some of them. Um, the first one that I would like to look at is PVG, uh, Pretium. Th that's, a, that's a mine or mining company. Um, you know, th this has been up since your report. Uh, you know, how, how do you feel about it? Was, was the thesis, is the thesis still valid or, you know, was it just caught in the gold price increase or, you know, were there some positive PRs that you think spun the stock upwards or what yeah. is the story there? I, I think this was caught up in the, in the gold price increase. Um, this is like a strange, this is a strange one because if you look at our technical data on the, the mine itself, it's basically played out exactly as we had said. We said, you know, this original feasibility agreement that um, the company had is saying that you're going to be averaging 20 grams per ton from this mine, where sort of in a region where no one's ever managed to do that, and where one of your consultants quit because they refused to put that on paper. Mm -hmm. And it was the same consultant that uh, wrote the same thing for Briex, which was like one of the most. Yeah. That's uh, that's been, the, I think, yeah, part behind the movie that that was, I think, filmed uh, yeah. Yeah, like two years ago or something. Yeah, yeah, I get it. So basically, if, like the you know, Briex, they said that their mine was like a huge like grams per ton development because the director went out and like sprinkled gold on top of the dirt. So that <laughs> they took samples of it yeah. that looked really good. Yeah. And it's I we think that's played out to the T. And mm -hmm. the more recent. Um, announcements have kind of shown that. I mean, you got the like, what is it? Late October, start of November. There was a the three Q, which basically showed that their grams per ton weren't even hitting ten, which is half of what they expected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it went down after that quite a bit. Yeah, it's, it's it went back down to like sort of where we started. Yeah, from memory. The 
I think it did get caught up in this sort of, sort of gold price increase as far as where the thesis stands. Um, and if our calculations are still correct on our assumptions of how much grams per ton they need to create a viable mine, then this is still a shot, just the increase in gold. Because you, you need to have some sort of grams per ton in the region of like 9.8. And this is a company that has sort of drilled or we believe selectively drilled through this very, very concentrated vein and to get these shitty half of what they expected results. Mm -hmm. And once this vein is depleted, we think that it's, you know, you're looking at like two grams per ton. Mm -hmm. So actually as the results will keep on coming and will be well, I think it will get progressively worse. Okay. If that's yeah. your, if and, that's... and it's really, like, it, it's not like I mean, for us, it's not a science because we can't see that they're exactly going through this this specific vein. Mm -hmm. But what we can see is like they were they had like a very well well not well designed um, specific plan of how high low they were going to dig um, and sort of the range they were going to like how many slopes they were going to put in body 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 body. And when they come out on a press release, you know, like six months later, and you see that they've gone sort of well above and beyond where they were meant to be digging that indicated to us that like we were hundred percent right. These guys are like selective mining mm -hmm. where they think that there's the most gold to appease investors in the short term. Okay. Yeah, sure. Got it. So they were trying to, yeah, make sure that, yeah. yeah. So I, yeah, I definitely think this is one of the ones that's going to just like get progressively worse, but, um, yeah, there is that macro yeah. risk or whatever. Okay. I mean, um, sure. there is a possibility of the increase in gold price. Yeah, there is a macro risk, but I just don't think it's relevant here. I mean, unless the price of gold, like, six x's <laughs> sure 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 um, i don't think that like it can be as viable as people think in the future yeah yeah i i, I get that most certainly um cool and then uh, we talked already about pro zeban actually you know that's been down let's say like 50 60 percent since your report uh but still you your target was kind of like um i think seven euros or whatever it's 13 euros now so still you know pretty a pretty hefty downside so do, how do you look at that do you think it's a still viable short or do you think the business is kind of like okay the cracks have you know been been shown and the investors reacted to that uh let me see what's the what I, I'm, I'm, I think it's 13 euros, but I'm not. Yeah. Sure. So I had, uh, and you had like seven target. and a half or something. Yeah. So I think the high end of our price target was 3.1 billion market cap, which were, which is about sort of where it is now, but yeah, then the, the sort of the average was about half of what it is now. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, maybe, uh, I think this is one of those ones that's a slow burn. Um, but it's also tech, so it could be one of those things that changes sure. very rapidly. Um, but this, the whole um, concept of the business model where um, you basically like got equity in crappy startups by giving them ad times was strange. And the, the thing that made it the strangest is like we couldn't exactly understand why they paid so much money these businesses. And the conclusion we came to was we just think that they picked up a really expensive ad slot and put in an ad for a real shit company. And then basically like they owned 10% of, you know, a, I don't know, let's say a hundred million dollar business because they put it in a 10 mil ad slot. Now let's say they do the same thing again next year, but it's an even higher ad slot. Then they get this, you know, off one sheet gain on an asset that is still shit. And then if you go through the list of um, acquisitions that they've made or partial acquisitions, um, you can see that a lot of them are just in liquidation. Fair enough. That that been that's been really interesting. The the kind of agreement between the companies, yeah. media for for equity and so on and so forth. Like that was uh, that was really. And that was one of the ones that you know the cash didn't match the profits. So like if you that that was like the earnings just didn't translate into any sort of cash flow. Yeah, sure. I, I don't know if you know Rocket Internet or if you're familiar with that. I mean, it mm -hmm. it's slightly oh. different, but it's also had a lot of like just a port wide portfolio of, of IT companies and startups and and uh, it, the, the stock is whatever but it it, it did go down well, well, after after the IPO quite quite quickly okay and then lastly Capitec so that's been one that been really really going against your thesis H how do you feel about that this is a South African lender focused on microfinance and it's been up around 70% I, I still think that Capitec is like Actually, one of the most abusive financial institutions in the world. Okay. 
uh, if you can, if you are lending money to, if you're the highest earning bank in South Africa, without any like specific reason why, like operationally, I, I don't. They always say that they have like this more trimmed down model. I don't see it. Um, it's really heavy. Uh, if you're the one of like the most profitable, not by a little bit, like literally off the charts profitable com in comparison with other banks in the world, and you make all your money by lending to the most at-risk demographic also, or one of the most at-risk demographics in the world, if you're okay with that, good for you. I think it's like abhorrent um, because the only way that you can be making money is by ripping these guys off. And we could talk about this for days, but like the biggest kicker that happened after our report was they actually put in um, your like recapitalized debt, uh, which basically um, it's like, let's say if you have debt and you can't pay it back, they'll give you a new loan to pay out your old loan. Right. Yeah. They have a fancy word for it. Skip my mind. But it was the same reason that African bank collapsed like a few years before. And this has been increasing to like getting to the levels of where African Bank was at when it mm -hmm, collapsed, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what people should be tracking, um, because this is this that was the crux of our thesis, right? Like these guys are lending out money willy nilly to people without jobs. I, I mean, I think Capitec has more clients than they are people have jobs in the U.S. In, in sorry, South Africa, and I understand that there's a lot of jobs that aren't like recorded in any sort of True. census. But to give you yeah. an idea, that's pretty, the scale, like, that's yeah, ridiculous. Sure. And then we just like, consistently get stories to this day of like how people are gaming the system, just get loans just because they can. And Capitec have essentially got to keep up this facade of, we think that it is a facade. We don't actually think that they're, um, you know, the, their write-offs are so low because they have great customers. That is, that would be one of the most miraculous uh, markets in the world if that was the case I don't think it is I don't think that it's just a coincidence that like uh, really sort of at risk financially at risk South Africans are somehow like able to you know maybe not eat food to pay their debt uh, I don't think that happens we think that they just have to keep up this facade that their write-offs are not yeah. that bad by having to recapitalize all these loans sure sure I uh, yeah that that's uh, that's the biggest point yeah and yeah certainly the stock has not gone in our favor but I mean I, I don't think that this is yeah I, I can't really stand behind yeah it. sure sure no I get it well of course it's like well it's like payday loans in the US obviously there the regulator right. made sure that the profits which were sometimes I mean you have some US states that still don't have a cap on interest rates or at least at least didn't have maybe a year ago when I looked at it or whatever so yeah I, I, I get that I get that well it's the same problem the US had like with those really like low what's it called like there's low limit credit cards where having regular um, predatory lenders, you also had predatory uh, borrowers. You were just like getting multiple cards and just never paying them back. And it's like such a small amount that you can't really do sure. anything about it. Okay. What are you going to do? Like call a, a guy to like go out and collect like 500 bucks. So, um, I, it's the same. I think it's become going to become the same sort of thing if it hasn't already. So actually, so actually it's bo kind of on both sides. Like first you have a business that, yeah, like you, you, yeah, yeah, you're making too much yeah. money. Um, or at least that's, that's what the accounting says. And then obviously you have 100%. the borrowers, which are also not great in terms of how much they borrow and stuff. Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's going to be really interesting to, to look at. It, do you, do you feel that there's an inherent catalyst that might really showcase whether that's true, whether the thesis is true or not? Well, I think, yes. Um, South Africa really put in a regulation, uh, recently to, uh, essentially create like a depo deposit insurance scheme between the banks. And one of the most fascinating issues here is that, um, South Africans give money to Capitec as a you know, a deposit taking institution and all that money is essentially lended out to like extremely high risk unsecured loans in microtransactions, which has historically for over 20 years not worked in South Africa, like entirely profitable. So I don't even know why you would consider like, and that was another thing as well. I mean, this history has shown that this model fails. Why is this the outlier? But to, to leave all that money there and then give it out to people that you know, we think can't afford to pay it back is a huge problem. And if there is a crunch, then I think that's where it will come. Okay. So actually the, 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 the insurance, uh, the deposit insurance is what might actually, um, showcase the, the problems. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I think so. I, it just needs to be looked up better. And the fact that the Reserve uh, Bank that regulates the banks in South Africa is privately owned by a lot of the people that also run the banks is a joke. Um, I mean, they, they put out a response to our report within like, I don't know, 30 minutes I was publishing it, which I can't even read the report in that time. Um, yeah. So one, like you have to make up your own mind. Like we can't do anything more on that, really. Keep tracking it, but there's not really too much else to say at this point. Fair enough. I mean, what, what I found pretty, pretty interesting was that um, one of the independent directors of Capitec was also uh was also sure, uh, shorting so. stein off which was like okay cool which capitec actually owned like 7.5 percent of or whatever yeah right yeah so it's like okay <laughs> you are shorting against your your own company so to speak of course he was independent director so it's not completely completely uh, yeah. connected but uh, but still it was uh, what, I, what i found pretty interesting yeah and and how's your overall experience uh, regarding shorting outside of the U.S.? Um, because you know we talked about a German company, a South African company. You know, is there is there some sort of place where you don't want to short anything anymore, or is it like okay, yeah, well, Germany, Germany, the regulators are assholes. <laughs> it's incredible, and it's not just us. Like if anyone puts out a short report in Germany, the response and you, like you could call like fraud or whatever. The response from the regulator is not let's investigate these claims. It's let's let's investigate the short seller. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's very like protectionist. I've never seen that before, and I've I've never seen it anywhere else. Australia is kind of interesting. Like we don't really do anything here, but um, you know, if you guys have put out short reports in Australia, and the immediate response is that the stock gets suspended for like a lot of time until someone comes out with a um, yeah. until the company can put out a response. So that one's also kind of weird because everyone's sort of left in a limbo yeah. um, for a long time. But yeah, I think Chinese companies as well, just generally. Um, it, regarding this, actually, you mentioned uh, Australia. What do you think about WiseTech? Because that was one that... About WiseTech? Yeah, which was the one that... Oh, the JCAP. Yeah, JCAP research, um, which, which actually got suspended for like a day or two or whatever. I think, I think, that, I think that there's some merit... To the wise tech report i think that some of it was i think that some of it was uh, wrong um but i don't think that strays away from the fact that like this valuation is just absolutely insane and the uh essentially like you're buying these businesses all these acquisitions for wise tech coming on board they spent i don't know like 500 million dollars at a what is it like i don't know let's say three times multiple and the company then trades at Oh, sorry. They bought five hundred million dollars of revenue. Let's say hypothetical, and the company trades. Uh, uh, they bought at a three times multiple, and the company trades at a thirty times multiple. You've essentially just like made market cap, uh, and I don't think that that's reinforced enough. That these guys are. Um, I don't think that they're really growing organically that much, but this is a big. Uh, for me, there is a lot of billions in there that are just like crappy acquisitions that they made. And they shouldn't have even had to make them if their system is so ubiquitous. Yeah, sure. And actually, regarding regarding Germany, like, have you had did Viceroy had any sort of uh, experience with the regulators themselves? Because obviously, you did Prozeben, but I don't think you get any, got any backlash on that, right? Or, um, well, yeah. I mean, they they go out to the journalists. Uh, Buffy went out to journalists and told them that we were being investigated before they even told us that we were under investigation. Regarding Prozeben. Yeah. Oh really? Oh, oh, I I missed that. Okay, so actually there was some sort of backlash regarding that as well. Okay. Yeah, I mean, nothing's come of it, but as soon, like almost like a, you know within the week that we put it out, it was like yeah, Reuters article come out. It's like you guys are being investigated for receiving. I was like, not that I know of, and it's like no, but I've heard from the state prosecutor that you are being investigated. I was like, okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Was it your first sort of experience regarding litigation or was my medics before that? I'm not sure. What I think my medics was the first one. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, sure. That's crazy. Yeah, that's... um. I mean, now Wirecard, of course, is a big uh, topic and that's been really... Yeah, I mean, I saw the response of the regulators in Germany against Financial Times. You know, I, I, I guess... um if a person comes out of out of nowhere and starts to make some claims okay maybe it warrants some sort of like check whether you know whether the claims are coming from from a like a like a like 
a space where, where you could believe them or whatever, but still, if, you know, th there shouldn't be such a reaction, but, you know, going after a new, like a pretty big newspaper, that's been really interesting to see and the reaction. Yeah. So certainly in Germany. Is right. Probably, it's, it's insane. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was, I just couldn't believe it either. So, uh, because I can really believe it, you know, if someone goes against, you know, like you guys regarding my medics, because it's us and you can, you know, sue. I mean, actually recently I've been researching one lawsuit, uh, focused on a short seller. Uh, it was a small cap and actually the, the lawsuit was essentially just to kind of, you know, push them to stop publishing, uh, about the company. They filed it like in a, in a New York when the short seller lives in California, they used a different name and so on and so forth. So it was, yeah. it was just, yeah, it was just a classic tactic, but, um, uh, yeah, but then with, with, uh, with, um, w when the regulator comes after you, that's uh, certainly something different now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, that was always like silence, trying to silence the critics thing. Yeah. I mean, I don't think my medics had, well, opinion again, but I don't think they had the intention of actually pursuing any sort of lawsuit with us. I think it was more of like a flex so that we'd shut up. Well, yeah, we all know about the visit from the FBI, so. Right, exactly. Which is, of course, yeah, which is completely different, uh, different thing, yeah. Yeah, that actually made it worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, of course, of course, I, I, everything <laughs> was made worse by that. I mean, if you, I think it was the senator, right? Yeah. Or like it was some sort of relationship with the senator that made it possible. Yeah, yeah fair enough then. Yeah, well, there was a letter that went out that he basically confirmed that like he told. Yeah. Yeah, it was insane. Like the whole story is nuts. Yeah, sure, sure. No, it's been... It's been, well, I have to say, of course, it's been fun for me <laughs> to, to watch from yeah. the sidelines, but I can imagine that the, the, the stress and everything yeah, must have been, must have been really Well, he's, he's getting a rain today. Um, so, oh, big shot. Um, we got, a, I think Joe Munder's actually there on site, which is like one of the um, cell site guys that first wrote about this. Okay, cool. Uh, taking pictures of the, um, the corrections. Okay. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, that, I mean, of course, for you guys must have been um, must be a great, uh, great time. Any actually any closing thoughts on my medics? Like, was there something that stood up and that you will really remember, you know, forever or not forever, but you know, when you will be old, and you will have kids, you'll say that ah, this my medics, like, what are you? What are you going to tell them? Like, was there yeah, one thing that I, I framed, I framed um, the lawsuit against me? Perfect. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the most memorable moment, to be honest. Sure, yeah. sure. It's a bit self-interested, but I'm not going to shy away from it. Yeah, I know. Of course, I, I think like if you did the right, you know, if you died, <laughs> did the work and so so forth, and then you can you can actually, yeah, yeah of course. Uh, no, I think that that was just such a. Here's the thing, like, like this is the this is like one of those companies that was just so active in responding to literally everything we said, and like <laughs> it was just garbage right like you could tell that this guy was just like talking like sometimes he was just talking out his ass um he surely like i have no idea how he got through like compliance to actually release those response to short seller reports and then these are all actually taken down but we've got them so that's but it's getting to the point where there's things like that happen in other companies that sort of mimic this and i think why cards that classic example where um you know, Braun will come out the day after, like, a, you know, all of these emails showing that, like, there was a bunch of, like, fake revenue that came from, like, these three companies. And it's like, oh, no, they're just grouped. Or, like, some stupid excuse he expects people to buy. And somehow the stock price is up there, so the people are buying it. I was like, this guy sounds like he's so full of shit. Um, but, yeah, why? Because it's not one of those ones I want to get involved. That's the jagger in the tree that Mark Cody's been talking about. Yeah, which is, I mean, I, I think that, you know, as I've done quite a few interviews already, and I'm just generally interested in, in short selling, I do it myself and so on and so forth. Like the timing is the ultimate question, really, because that's, that's it. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean. Well, it's so strange. Like you had, um, I mean, even John Hampton was, uh, he, did, he did a podcast with, I think it was um, Jolly Swagman, who escapes me, but he was, he was saying, you know, Brie X was a better short after it fell 90% before, um, you know, like it's maybe that's the same with Tesla. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to hang around there for better, better short after they hit the car with two bricks than, than before. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sure. Sure. I get that. I mean, that was a great point. I, I listened to your interview with, um, 
with this uh, Rask Finance uh, guys. And yeah. that was that I felt was really interesting because I think that, uh, you know, th that is a valid point. You know, the first drop can be really big, but you still can, you know, get get into a short position and can still actually ride it out. Um, maybe not to zero, whatever the situation is, but still there is, yeah, quite a, quite a... Exactly. I mean, you're sort of trying to, you're getting out before the, I don't know, it's the, maybe this could be, um, you know, pre ship one day, you know, like it wasn't this most recent fall, but let's say these grades keep going down. It's been pretty consistent. Maybe pre will be a better shot at, you know five bucks and it was a 13. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I mean, we'll see. We'll see what the beautiful be yeah. benefit of hindsight and <laughs> then we can exactly. talk about, yeah. That, Hindsight's that, a bitch. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and uh, just one more question. Like, so Germany is like, it's been really, really, um, let's say, interesting experience regarding short selling. Uh, have you, mm -hmm. have you saw any sort of like similar response in some geographies uh, just generally, or, you know, is it really okay uh -huh. to, to short outside of the US? I don't think there's anything similar to what happens over there okay. that I've ever seen. Okay. It, it's just the most absurd, like, banana republic um, process. And I, it was very similar with Fraser and Wirecard. Um, again, you had a journalist call Fraser saying, oh, I received a letter from... Someone leaked me the letter, letter from this, uh, you know, Frankfurt um, state prosecutor saying that they recommended you were fine to the court and phrase like why and he's like oh for refusing to like you know i don't know what it was refusing to like assist with some sort of investigation sure. like they didn't even tell me like it was just such a they it, and the i wouldn't even have as much of a problem if they just went out and recommended a fine mm. but to leak it to the press fucked up yeah and it hasn't happened once it was the same thing with um Stephen. yeah so that's that's crazy yeah that's crazy yeah. Um, I know that in France, they also, they had some sort of... Yeah, France, France is not great, apparently. I, I've never experienced anything there. Yeah. But... Yeah. yeah, I was casino and things things like that. And Muddy Waters had some... Casino, problems. yeah, that was yeah. a bit fucked up. But I think people are actually opening up to the idea that casino really was a piece of shit and that there needs to be some sort of... Um, great criticism over there but i don't think that that's happening in germany at all sure sure which which is yeah I, I didn't even check like the german newspaper on how they were you know uh actually talking about either wired card or the allegations because i was just getting news from financial well they're Times. investigating the ft yeah i know i know that yeah, yeah yeah but like i didn't know they're not investigating wire card for some fucking reason <laughs> sure. get the ft it's a classic like classic bath and move every single time yeah it, it is really insane yeah it is really insane um, yeah, I was just, like, yeah, I, I never saw actually the response in the German media, how they would spin it. Like if the journalist there would be like, okay, well, we're not going to say much about that. Or they were like, oh, okay, well, probably the short sellers or whatever. I, I don't know how, how the media reacts there. Um, yeah, to, to uh, this, yeah. Uh, badly. I think with Wirecard, it's actually just beginning to flip now. Mm. Um, I mean, you have these guys that are, I think one paper wrote like a bad report on, um, wire card or you know not even bad it was objective uh, about the ft situation and they got slated by wire card and at that point it was just okay yeah we're going yeah yeah welcome to europe yeah. I, I, I think and i think that yeah. has become more objective now than it whatever was in the past yeah it's a tricky thing i mean yeah i, I think in europe you know usually the, the regulators are yeah j just generally maybe london is i'm not sure about london or the uk and how the fca works there regarding short selling but i haven't heard many of these kind of stories but really france and germany uh stands yeah. up uh stands up as a as a pretty yeah. pretty impressive um examples of how the regulators can work and what is an, yet another risk for short sellers. <laughs> so just uh, yeah, on top right. of the all of the other stuff. I think they need to. I think they need to focus more on like whistleblower protection as a priority rather than you know vilifying critics. Uh, and and it's the same. It's the same like everywhere. I mean, even on like the U.S. is probably one of the better places to be a whistleblower. But even then, I mean my medics like fuck these guys were suing all the whistleblowers who are meant to, um, which is it's that gray area that the whistleblowers are meant to be protected in the, not only in the sense that um, they're giving data anonymously but also in the sense that um 
you can't sue someone for blowing the whistle on you, right? That's that's a crime. That's a federal crime. So if by extension, when my medics sued these employees that were like blowing the whistle and like, I don't even know, it was something completely unrelated, but there was such a straightforward, like linear relationship with whistleblowers and people yeah. getting sued, and, like ex-employees getting sued. Like it was just so blatant that this was happening for that reason that it was insane. And those guys took a huge fucking risk and they're probably the ones that, um, really sort of brought this thing down. Not yeah, sure. Stories. Sure. I hope that they will get the reward, uh, which is, which has been a really great program. I, so I think in the U S to, to kind of make sure that they are going out there and stuff. Yeah. Now, uh, regarding these kind of controversial topics, I have another question. Uh, would you want to comment on Roddy Boyd's article on Fraser? Um, no, I think I just had to, had to ask. That's fair. I mean, Fraser and I still work together. So no, I mean, if he wants to make a response, I'll let him do that. But I think the fact that we're still working together is not a response for me. Got that. Um, and actually, uh, do you have any new favorites, uh, that you are looking at regarding stocks? Like, do you have anything that you're working on and you want to share, or is it just more about, you know, catching up uh, with, uh, with what's happening and at, at, at AT and X or whatever? Yeah, I think, I think the next couple of months might be a little slow. We've got some stuff that we're working on that we're not going to publish um, that we might, you know, trade, but it's, it's again, it's like that Christmas time. There's not really, I just want to go on holidays. To be honest. <laughs> sure. <laughs> a long year. Yeah. Yeah. got it. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so what is your favorite story then a fraud story then, um, uh, regarding the past we've talked about what's what's been and it doesn't have to be your oh, yeah. your short but something that you you learned about and you felt that was great uh i think it was i think it was something that we worked on and it was a bit eye-opening that there is some such a strong reach within uh, politically connected uh ceos that someone would dare to have their mate send over FBI to a critical house without any active like open investigation or warrant or anything with guns while his wife and kid were there. That just kind of, I, it made Mark's blood boil too, but I, I think that was um, sort of towards the, like the start of when we were doing this. And now it, it's always in the back of my mind and I definitely um causes some anxiety if you know what i mean like it's always playing in the back of your mind like holy shit what if this happens um you know i think it's a bit scary i, I completely understand but, yeah but you know I'm, I'm not like i can just go out and become an accountant now so <laughs> sure sure i i think once you're there i mean once yeah, yeah i don't think you can do that that's for sure that's for sure true i think that you would be like, okay well yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty much stuck in this. Yeah, I, I can right. see you in KPMG or this kind of head of audit thing. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't get any clients. I just like knock back all the audits. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, this guy <laughs> asks too many questions. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> he knows how we do it. So, God damn it. Yeah, for, for sure. Exactly. And actually regarding my medics, like, was there, because you obviously talked about the need to restrain yourself from you know, overreacting. But at that point, you know, it was obviously not you that, you know, were visited by the FBI agents, but of course, you know, you, 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 you have this sort of risk. Like, I don't think that there exists an overreaction for having the CEO of the company send the FBI to your house. I think it's just completely like the lowest thing you could possibly do. Uh, so I think whatever reaction you have is appropriate. I get that. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite nickname that someone gave you be it the management or the shareholders or bag holders as some of uh, us like to call them? I don't know. There was this guy that keeps emailing me, um, saying how much he hates me and he calls me, um, Gabe from spice boy research. <laughs> I think that's by far the best one. <laughs> spice boy research. Cool. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God damn it. Yeah, that's probably pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, yeah, that's that's a very good one. Like a very bad one, yeah. but like in in the sense of quality of the of the Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Oh, we get we get so much of this stuff. 
it's insane. Sure. Like we have just hundreds of like, I'm going to find you and like kill you and like burn down your family's house and everything. Yeah. It's, in, it's incredible. Yeah. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, loses its vanity after a little while, but yeah. Ah, it's crazy. Ah, it's crazy. Yeah, okay, but the Spice Boy is certainly, certainly probably a very good one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was the most ridiculous response of the management? So we talked about some of the reports, you know, what do you think was the most ridiculous one, be it, you know, that it like complete any sort of arguments or, you know, what was the kind of the one that stood out for you? Um, I'm not sure. I, I think, I don't think, I think that my medics ones were ridiculous. But he tried to address issues and it was, I'm going to say coherent for the lack of a better word. Like you can understand what he was trying to do. He was just wrong. Um, but things like the athletics, like athletics response is probably one of the most ridiculous ones. Cause have literally written a report like slating a management team because I've all run frauds in the past. And you say that my report is wrong and we like stand behind the integrity of our management team. I mean, it's pretty objective. Uh, I don't know. I think that. Yeah. 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 I know. I get that. Yeah. I mean, in the end, yeah. I mean, when when you when you when you raise such points and they just don't bother to to kind of showcase that, yeah. Then that's um. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I, I, yeah. I, I'm I'm not sure how the companies are doing or if they're kind of learning to live with it or you know I don't know how you know if they're thinking about it a bit differently than in the prior prior years. Again, I'm I'm 26, so you know I, I don't have 10 years of experience shorting either. So I don't know if the companies are learning how to do it better to respond or not. But I guess um, um, uh, we'll see. I think that like there isn't a need for a response if you you know, like your books are open enough. I don't know, if, if a lot of these times, like we put out reports, these companies books are so opaque that there's very little, there's not sort of a, there's a very clear cut path, which directs you to like an outcome that if you take it all at face value, this is, looks great. Um, but then when you sort of like, if you had to peel back this glass and just look at what's making up these numbers or like what's the underlying factor of like why this is like going up or down or whatever. Um, that's where I think we really find the like the crap. And if that doesn't exist, like sure, like your stock price is going to go down, but there's not going to be a short sell that comes after you. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a, I, I, I guess a lot of your reports raise more questions or at least they, or, or they show some different facts or whatever. Uh, but yeah, I guess that if, if it's, if it's open enough, the question shouldn't be there in the first place, I guess. Right. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Or if someone were to fact check the report and they said, well, you missed this kind of thing because it's obviously there or whatever. Yeah, sure. I, yeah. Uh, I get that. Um, I still think like the, there was one really good response to a, it wasn't an activist short seller, but someone wrote like a short note on seeking alpha on Netflix. And then Netflix CEO put out a uh, response. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. Um, and I think that was potentially one of the better responses to a short report I've ever seen. It was a little while ago, but I think that was a sort of, that's as good as you can get. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, it's a tricky business to respond anyways. Yeah. But I guess, yeah, if you, if you have to respond, then it's kind of already bad because you don't have the, uh, the accounting that open. I'll try to find a link for it and send it to you. Yeah, sure. Please do that. That that'd be that'd be great. Yeah. Um, and I know I just got like two more questions. Um, I know that mm -hmm. uh, Viceroy is derived from a, a name of a tulip, so tulip mania. Uh, did you select it for some reason, or was it just like okay, this is my favorite mania, or I don't know how you guys decided to put uh, to, to select it or whatever. Uh, but is there is there something behind it, or just thought like that's that's probably what we want to look at, like tulip mania stuff. Yeah, I think that this is the Viceroy, and apparently I'm wrong on this. So, you know, I should probably fact check a little better. But the Viceroy uh, was a very expensive tulip. And so tulip mania was um, built around this idea that the bulbs were like traded as commodities. So I suppose it kind of made sense. And there was the satire in the, in the picture of the painting I thought was pretty funny. Yeah, sure. Because it was just like a bunch of monkeys trading tulips for gold. And 
like I think that was like the biggest dig you could have at the Dutch at the time. Sure. Sure. An acceptable meme. Yeah, it's that's exactly. It's like a subliminal almost meme, I suppose. Sure, sure. But there's it, it's still, you know, relevant. I mean, you have people trading shit for money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, and that's just like what we're trying to point out. Yeah. That's a great point. And and the last question that I have, if you had to start all over again, what would you have done differently? Um, I probably wouldn't have been anonymous at the onset. I totally respect other people that are anonymous. Um, but I didn't really have a great reason to be. Um, I was more just terrified of what people would think of what I wrote. And it's funny because like we started writing these reports as almost a resume. Like we, I didn't know nice, like we were writing stuff and doing things uh, like channel checks with people and like sending them reports and like companies with thought was shit because this was like, um, you know, it was a time stamped research report on an actionable trade. And if I walked into like a place and I had an interview, I could show them that I've been doing this thing. And then like the first interview I had and I showed someone that they were absolutely terrified. And like, you know, it was one of their friends that was like a huge investor in the business. <laughs> basically told me to fuck off. Uh, so I stopped doing that. Fair enough. Yeah. I think, I think, I think that's what I would have done. Differently. And, you know, I can still put memes in my own Twitter account. It's okay. <laughs> you are so, yeah, you're, you're, you're fine. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, it's been it's been really great insight, and I would really like to thank you again for for your time. It's been really awesome chatting with you. Likewise. Uh, obviously, a lot of story today, so that that that's been that's been really amazing. Uh, so once again, thanks a lot, and I hope you uh, I hope you will come back soon sometime uh, to All chat right. again. Maybe after uh, 18x will finally fall down. <laughs> Maybe. All right. Well, let me know. <laughs> sure. Sure. Well, thanks a lot. All right. Thanks, mate. That is it for our interview with Gabe. If you're interested in something we talked about, do not hesitate to check out the description of the episode. There are tickers of the companies we mentioned, as well as Gabe's Twitter and Viceroy's website. Lastly, do not forget to subscribe to the podcast. There will be new interviews coming soon. Thanks a lot for listening.